What's up, guys? Good morning, and welcome to the Forgotten Jesus Podcast. Pastor, I say good morning because most people are listening right now on their way to work, as they're cleaning their house, as they're getting their kids to school. That's what I'm consistently hearing. So what a great way to start off your Monday morning with us here on the podcast. Yeah, but you always say, hey, guys, what about the girls? Hey, ladies. Hey, guys. What's up, y'all? Like, I don't know. I mean, when I, I mean, say guys, We do have I women mean, who listen to the podcast. We're all inclusive. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean everybody. Right. So okay. welcome. So glad you're joining us today. My name's Andrew. We have Pastor Robbie Gowdy and Candy with us. And today we have a little treat. Here we go. What's the treat? What is this? We're talking about the temptations. Oh, gosh. Not that. Not those temptations. I, 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 sorry. You not said we were going. Not those temptations. Were you, like well, song. you said we were going into the temptations today, and it instantly. <laughs> Triggered triggered wow. in a positive way how much i missed listening to the temptations wow did you grow up with the temptations <laughs> uh so i remember it my girl is the temptation song right is that I the one so. i was just playing yeah, yeah i remember trying out for show choir in seventh grade mm. with the song my girl mm. and i got in I, I i made show choir who knew now what who exactly knew? i'm waiting show choir show What's choir is like, like um it's like a singing group at school okay what's the show part uh you do shows and you're a choir like it's just, okay. the name makes perfect sense candy for exactly what it is there's it's not much more than that yeah, yeah like, that's like, it. i'm just thinking choir you think yeah, 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 but you put on thinking, shows. like do you dance or anything, oh sing dance like a, oh, event. yeah okay. i'm waiting for my turn on a sunday now, morning now andrew bolton yes i don't think we knew you were in show choir uh, well, that's because I just now told you. Yeah, yeah. So we, there's yeah. a lot you of things sing. about Andrew. We don't I know. no, I think they just needed extra people in show. Oh choir. my gosh! No, I cannot sing. Really? No, nah. no, oh. oh, he can't sing. He faked it. No, I cannot sing. Shows you how desperate they were. They were pretty desperate. Well, Matt, you Tennessee. know what? I think they just saw the potential. Hey, we can yeah. craft this yeah. young man. <laughs> we like, like this guy. It's like yeah. a piece into of the clay. next Andy Williams. Ooh. You know, like they, yeah, they just saw potential in me that didn't see in myself. So, all right. Anyways, moving on. Today we're talking about the temptations. Of Jesus. Yeah, and so we just got through our uh, water paradigm journey the last week, if you remember, mm -hmm. and we talked about the six-fold process that um, we saw all through the Old Testament. Anybody want to take a stab at the six-fold process? Okay, so you're talking about what we saw, like this continued through Scripture. Starts with chaos. Yes. Secondly, what? Uh, chaos, uh, water, water. You got yeah. it. Okay. What's the third one? Chaos, mm. water, order, S close. No spirit over water, over water. Okay. Then God's, uh, order. Yeah. God's expected order. Then, um, or God's spoken word, God's expected order, and then temptation or yeah. a testing. There was right. a testing after that. And we learned that every single person in the old Testament, going back to Noah or Genesis, Noah, Moses, Joshua, they all what? Peter. Were tested? They all were tested mm -hmm. and they all what? Failed. Failed every time. So yeah. they know every time in the Bible someone's tested, they are failed until we get to the testing of Jesus. And we talked last week about that's this whole layout of the, of the, uh, of the baptism, right? So we have chaos in the world, Roman Empire, Greek influence. We have... Um, water jesus goes to be baptized then we have the actual holy spirit over yeah. the water mm -hmm. descending down upon jesus we have the voice of god go, go figure speaking right we have expected order meaning god saying you're gonna this is the ministry you're gonna go out now, did you for, say this is the one place that all three members of the trinity are seen at the same place yeah time? that's at the baptism yeah, yeah and yeah. i and i said mm -hmm. that refutes uh, a common a uh, heretical idea called modalism. Modalism is the idea that God is not three distinct persons. It's Jesus in different forms, which are, we reject Different that. modes. Different modes, yeah, modalism. Yeah. But we would say, no, that can't be right because so all you have to do is find one place where all three of them are present and the baptism is one. Mm -hmm. We also see it in Jesus giving baptism instructions, baptized in the name of the Father, Father Son, Son, the Holy Spirit. He yeah. doesn't say baptize in Jesus' name, which some mm -hmm. people wrongly uh, so, and so the question is, how do they get to modalism? They, they use, and this is just my answer for a lot of things, uh, they use Acts, the book of Acts, as a prescription for ministry and not a description of ministry, meaning yeah. they'll take situ. This is how, uh, again, people get or create theologies on you have to be baptized to be saved. Right, because they take it as 
prescriptive rather than descriptive. Yeah, because they find one line in Acts where it says you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, that makes sense there. But then you look just a few chapters later and it says repent and believe in order to be saved or Mm -hmm. repent and be baptized. So which one is it? It's all the above. Okay, Mm so um, we take Acts descriptively describing things, not prescriptively all the time. So now we get to Jesus. Jesus is going to step into this temptation immediately after the spirit descends, the water, spoken word of God, expected order. Then we have Jesus going right into the temptation. And Mark chapter one tells us that it was the spirit, the Holy Spirit who thrusted him, mm. compelled him mm. to the temptation. This was part of the the process to right. prove his identity. Okay, so go to Matthew chapter four. And uh, someone asked us on the, um, one of our podcast listeners asked, asked us about how to use this harmony of the gospels. This is what I, I've used this for years and years. And probably one of the, besides the Bible, you know, complete Bible, this right here, the New Testament harmony of the gospels is probably the second most used book I've ever used because I'm always trying to see and determine when did these events happen in the life of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what the harmony of the gospels does, if you're watching uh, YouTube, it puts in parallel fashion, all of the synoptics and John. That's why I like the CSB Harmony of the Gospels over the Throckmorton because it doesn't include John. John was written later and so it's harder to connect, but this one does. And what you're looking for is you're trying to read the same account from different perspectives. And also you're trying to determine when did these things happen? Mm -hmm. And it's important, you'll see, as we study in the days ahead. So Matthew chapter four, the, the, the temptation account is found in two gospels in at length Mark just alludes to it. You know, yeah. he went to the spirit. Yeah, yeah. He, he, went he into only the, has two verses. Yeah, exactly. Two verses. Okay. So Candy, let's read Matthew chapter four. And what we're going to see is for the first time in human history, this temptation, this attack, or this uh, trial will end in victory for the first time. Mm-hmm. And what Jesus is going to do, listen, he's going to give us a blueprint or a formula for uh, responding to the enemy when he attacks us. And so let's look at what Jesus is doing here. So Matthew chapter four, just going to read the first part. Okay. Uh, verse one. Verse one. Yep. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you were the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, let's stop there. So let's take them in um, uh, successive order, okay? Before I get into these, let me just share with you something that's happening, because we love connections, and we love Keshers, and we love Mm -hmm. remezes from the old and new, okay? What we're going to see here is this is a pattern for Satan. In fact, I would say almost every attack, every attack in life from Satan will fall, fall into one of these three categories, every attack. Now, granted, I would say every, every sin leads back to idolatry. You could say that in adultery, but in a sense, the, this is, if, if we were to steal the playbook of the opposing team and uh, for a football team or, or get it, steal is probably a bad word, borrow it, <clears throat> find it, find, on find it on the side of the road. Somewhere. Right. Right. Steal yeah. is not good. <laughs> but if you were to take the, uh, the opposing team's playbook and you would look at exactly how they run the, their plays, you could beat them. You could overcome them. Okay. So it's like watching game film, right? This is the game. That's good. This is the game film of Satan. And he only runs three plays. And friends, listen, once you understand these three plays, mm. it, the light bulb will come on yeah. in your life. Because you're like, wow, I've seen that. This is the temptation here. Yeah. Okay. These are the three plays he runs. He's been running this since the beginning of time. He will run this to the end of eternity or the end of time when he's bound and sent to the lake of fire. Now, let me show you where they are. Go to Genesis 3. Okay. Andrew, you're going to go to uh, 1 John 2.16. Mm-hmm. So you're going to go to 1 John 2.16. Candy's going to go to Genesis three, and we're going to show word. you this. Th- word Good job. There you go. First John two sixteen. Yeah, two sixteen. Let's read first Candy, and I want you to see the three categories of attack. Okay, okay. read them real quick, and I want you to listen. What verses? For it. Uh, verse six, three six. Verse six. Okay. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Okay, so we have three 
three different categories here. <clears throat> she saw the tree was good for food. It was also delightful to look at, gaze at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Right. Three categories. Now, let's fast forward to Andrew yep. and let's read First John 2.16. Okay. What John's going to do... <clears throat> Sorry. What are you going to do? No, you're saying. Okay. John is going to put these in, in, a, in three categories as well. Watch this. Okay, I'm going to start in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, he loves... Uh, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, 16, for everything in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but it's from the world. Okay, that's the three categories. Now, what does that have to do with the temptation of Jesus? Watch this. If you're taking notes, and we'll give you notes to look at, but and we'll put, a, we'll put the triangle up, Robert. Remind me, I have a triangle that has the three temptations the three fears that come or the three yeah. emotions that come along mm -hmm. with it. And, the th and then I even have them connected to Enneagram numbers. We're talking about that moment because based on your Enneagram, you, you, you fall in one of these categories and you have a propensity to this temptation more than others. Okay. The first one is the temptation of Jesus we read was he tried to tempt him with bread. Now that's important because he was hungry, right. like legitimately mm -hmm. hungry, right? In his humanity. Starving. And so, yeah. And number one is, so the first temptation we're going to see is appetite. The temptation of appetite. Right. You want more. Now we saw that in Genesis chapter, well, we see that with stones in the bread. We saw that in Genesis chapter three with what? She looked and saw that it was good for food, good for food, appetite. Right. And then John says the lust of the uh, eyes. Of the, lust flesh, of the flesh. flesh. Yeah. Lust, lust of the, of the flesh. Eyes. Appetite. Now, the second temptation of Jesus, okay. we'll get to it in a moment, is mm -hmm. approval. Satan's going to say, if you're really God, throw yourself off the temple. Leap yeah. off, man. Come on, let's prove yourself. Show everybody who you are. Get a following. That's the same temptation we saw in Genesis with pleasing to the eyes. You're appealing. You're pleasing to the eyes to look at. And then the third one is the lust of the eyes, this mm -hmm. approval from other people, this acceptance from other people. Okay. The third temptation Jesus is going to face is, take a guess. Well, according to 1 John, it's pride. Ambition. Yes. Yeah. The pride of life. Mm -hmm. So ambition to have all the temples of the world. That's the first temptation. Candy read the desire for gaining wisdom, ambition, wanting more wisdom. And then finally, the pride of life. So you have all these things. So here's what we're going to do in our time. We're going to break these three things down. Now I learned this, this uh, alliteration idea from Dave Rhodes with Clarity yeah. House. And then um, Mike Breen is who he originally got it from. So just give credit there. And then I'm going to unpack it further. But they actually call this the three life drifts that happen. Mm -hmm. Basically, every person listening has a propensity or a disposition in one of these areas. And here's what happens. When we are struggling in one of the areas, we self-medicate with another area. Mm -hmm. For example, if I'm weak in ambition, I can't get ahead, then I will seek approval from other people when until it's uh, a problem. Right. Okay. So, so does that make sense? So mm -hmm. if, if you have a problem with appetite, then you may go and, you know, seek ambition or whatever, but you'll see how it works. So the first one is temptation. Number one, appetite or self-dependence to provide for the mm -hmm. appetite. And notice what, notice what Satan does to Jesus. He comes to him at a moment of weakness. And just remember, Satan never fights fair. Did you yeah. know that, Andrew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never fights fair. You people say, he wouldn't kick you when you're down. Of course he nah, would. When else would he kick you? Yeah, of course yeah. he would. He just continues to get. So Jesus is at the lowest point, 40-day uh, fast. He's starving. And he comes to him and he says, listen, and here's the key line. If you are, if you really are right. who you say you are, the son of God, which is a code word for Messiah, then tell these stones to what? To become bread. To become bread. Now, why is that fascinating? If you know the culture, it's a pretty interesting line there. Um, what do you call a... A Bedouin who can get food instead of water Ooh, out of a rock. Yeah. Moses? No. <laughs> no. That's good. I like where you go. No. Because if you were in the desert back then, remember, yeah. we're talking, when, when it says wilderness, it's not lush, green, rolling right, hills right. of Tuscany and Italy. This is a wilderness. This, I mean, this is a desert. desert. Barren, dry, hot. humid, hot. Yeah. And and we believe, if we go to Israel, uh, in the distance of Jericho, I mean, you remember this. Uh, when you're standing in Jericho, you look across the valley and in a rock, on top of the rock, there is the 
is the uh, Monastery of Temptation, where they believed historically Jesus was tempted there in that desert area. Mm -hmm. Who knows, but possibly there. But in the desert, watch this, the limestone could form, the rock limestone could form and look like puffy pieces of pastry yeah. from a distance. Hmm. So it gave the kind of illusion, you know, in a desert, uh, they resembled uh, bread. And so the, the devil is actually tempting Jesus to provide something for himself. You ready for this? Separate and apart from the plan of God. Yeah. And what does Jesus say to them? Say to him, he get said, behind do not, me, Satan. Well, <laughs> yeah, eventually. Said, it is written. It is written. So he's yeah. going to quote scripture. Now, you have to remember, in the first century, they could not go to, uh, to um, worships, you know, down the street. They couldn't go to the Texaco. They couldn't yeah. go to Valero to buy. Uh, Bucky's. They couldn't go to Bucky's. Man. If they had Bucky's, they couldn't go to Bucky's. Brisket, yo. Yeah, they couldn't get a brisket sandwich. <laughs> By the way, this will change your life. Hey, the, if Bucky's wants to send us brisket sandwiches, yeah. just saying. Okay. We'll take it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm all good. Well, <laughs> okay, moving well, on. Well, Bucky's, uh, here's the next level insight for Bucky's. Instead of getting the brisket, which we always get, try the turkey it's sandwich. Good, I'm just telling you, that'll change your life. I was I'm not doing it. Turkey I'm just saying, I'm a creature barbecue. habit. I love their brisket. Oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah, that's true. It's amazing. Chopped, okay. sliced, whatever. It's, you it's know, good. it's all good. I know that. And don't forget the fudge, because fudge yeah, is always fudge. good. Clean okay. restrooms? Oh, good. Yeah, Not like, like they got it going on. They, they, they got it. everything. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. But here's the thing. You couldn't go to a Bucky's back then yeah. and get a, a Dasani water. You couldn't go get a brisket sandwich. They had to depend mm -hmm. upon God to provide for their daily needs every day. So you couldn't make a run for the border. You couldn't go to Taco Bell. If you were hungry... You needed God to provide. And here's the thing. The problem we have today, it's hard for us to understand this. The problem we have today is because of our convenience, mm -hmm. it decimates our dependence. Yeah. Okay. Our convenience to go to the store, go to the fridge, cook a meal, r reduces our dependence upon God. Right. They had to depend upon God. So this is a real attack against Jesus, and it's an attack against Jesus' identity. Don't miss this, because mm -hmm. here's how he starts. And this is how Satan, you know, he, he reminds me of one of those bullies in school, you know. If you really are cool, then you'll do this, Galilee. Yeah. If you really mm -hmm. are, you know. Uh, are we unpacking childhood trauma right now? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Galaxy, you know, well, you know, if you want to fit in, take a sip of yeah. beer, Andrew, or yeah. hit, take a hit of this joy. If you really are part, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And um, it, it's really, it's really a line we hear all the time. You know, that's his line. Yeah. If you're a real man, you'll go do this, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if you're really holy, then you'll portray. This is the lie of Satan all the time. If you're really smart as you think you are, if you are, yeah. you see the line here? Okay, so here's the thing I want to remind you of this. What we learned from Jesus is we have nothing to prove mm -hmm. and no one to impress. Yeah, I heard it years ago from a mentor of mine. It's harder to live mm -hmm. than it is to accept, but you got to remember, and I want to say this to you, you have not, the faster you can get here yeah. mm -hmm. in life, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something yeah, mm -hmm. in this world. So here's how it works with this temptation, this temptation of appetite. On one side, you have rejection. On the other side, you have acceptance. Okay. Uh, so uh, you have rejection on one side. Is that right? I didn't see it right. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Rejection and acceptance. Yep. Exit rejection and acceptance. So you're trying to you're trying to be accepted uh, for this appetite. Is that right? No, that's not saying right. Hold on, let me check. You're this. saying it with confidence. I though. am saying it with confidence. Therefore, I believe it's right. No, dun, dun, dun. no, it's no, it's sorry. Fascinate. No, it's a uh, need versus satisfaction. I'm like that doesn't sound right. I knew a car was okay. Here on one side you have need. This is what I need. On the other side I have. Uh, this is what satisfies me, or okay. this is what I want. Mm -hmm. So we have Wants want and needs. And needs. That's okay. what I'm getting at. Okay, that's the polar opposite. So, and every one of these will have the same thing. I, I'm confusing myself. Okay, now why is this important? Because the fear, the 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 emotion that comes along with appetite when you don't have an appetite satisfied is what the core issue here. If you get to the core issue of why you have an appetite, and if you're listening, it's the appetite for more. It's the appetite mm -hmm. for fame. It's the appetite for things. It's the appetite for Amazon packages. It's the, mm. At the core, it, yeah. there's an issue. And the core issue is fear. Yeah. 
you have a fear of something that you're trying to self-medicate yeah. with this never-ending appetite. And here's what mm. fear says to you. This is how you know you've fallen into the temptation. Fear says, I'll never have enough. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll never be enough. Well, that's the next one. Oh, that's but, the next yeah, one. That's the next one. Or, or <clears throat> edit may, that out. May, may, no, no, maybe. No, maybe. maybe. I mean, let, let me say, maybe possibly I'll never be enough, but because it's more, it's, yeah. the, it's the idea of more fear is the lack of trust in God and fear has two sides. I'll never have enough. So I keep gathering more. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's one side. Or I have a fear of losing. So I hoard what I have. Yeah. So I don't have enough. So I want to get more or I, 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 I feel I'm going to lose what I have. So I just protect and I don't get, give, uh, g- give anything to anyone. And the mm-hmm. appetite that, that it leads to is consumerism. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, why is this crazy? Why is this, why we address this? Because consumerism is a direct, uh, attack against discipleship. Discipleship is giving one's life away. Yeah. Was it is investing. It's about other people. Yeah. Consumerism is about me. Consumerism undermines discipleship. Now, here's what I said earlier. If you're an Enneagram, okay, and, and I don't know what you believe about the Enneagram. We use it here because we think it's helpful. I think it's helpful for discerning one's own traits and challenges and blind spots you don't see. So that's how yeah. we use it. I don't use it as a if you're not, you're not you're creating, creating your whole identity around it, yes. Yeah, or even yes. using it against you. Like, there you go. You're uh, a, you're being a three again, three again Robbie. Yeah. yeah, which I am. Which, but, <laughs> which I am. But, yeah. But what are you, Andrew, by the way? Uh, guess. Three. Nope. No, you're um, no. seven. No, no, Six. surprisingly. Seven's a joy person. Yeah, Always yeah. having fun. No, nine. I'm a nine. I'm are you a nine? Right? Mm-hmm. Wow. I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Candy and I, believe it or not, live in the same home with the same number. Yeah. Oh, we're wow. both we're both threes. We're yeah. twinsies. Well, we're that's why you threes. guys accomplish so much. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. We, yeah. I'm just over here trying to keep. We the try pace. a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and have a little fun along the way. Makes sense. That's why you're on the podcast, yeah. Andrew. You know we didn't what's know. funny? So I we think didn't know what uh, we're pulling over for a second on the Enneagram. Oh, I think mama. what uh, the the light bulb that really went off for me about the Enneagram is somebody came in and one thing they said was uh, the Enneagram is not who you are, but who you thought you needed to be in order to get through life. To cope with the world, You know yes. what I'm saying? So yes. I guess when I was a kid, my life is crazy. We can unpack my life story later. But So I became the peacemaker. So oh, if wow. some people are upset, I'm gonna be happy. If wow. people, you know, whatever, whatever, so I'm just always trying to keep the peace. That's good. Mm. That's yeah, good. and I think I grew up wanting to be accepted and approved mm. and yeah. And I think a lot of people will do that for time. Yeah, it's how you, it's the front you put on to protect. Right outwardly from being heard in with it. Yeah. Okay. So the, if you're an Enneagram, uh, five, six, or seven, you have a tendency to fall into this temptation of appetite, always wanting more, more information, more knowledge, more insight, more understanding, more people. If you're a seven, more experiences, more encounters, right? You want right. to have more fun. Okay. okay. That's the temptation of appetite. So let's move on to number two. So appetite fear is the core issue desire for more leads to consumerism. Okay. I know this is a lot more than we normally take the temptations, but I think this is helpful for ourselves at the end of the, yeah, exactly. Like we, we will understand ourselves better at the end of this. Yeah. Let's go to temptation. Number two, temptation. Number two is approval. This is the one I'm guilty of a lot. Okay. Verse five, Matthew four, five. Five. And by the way, we'll get to this at the end, but Jesus responds to every temptation with the word of God. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And it's always, by the way, the same book, Deuteronomy. His say, favorite the, book the of the old. Weightiest one. Weightiest one, yeah. Uh, Candy, can you read? And I need a charger because Verse apparently five. this computer's running hot today and I'm running out of uh, battery, right Robert. Okay, verse five. Okay. Go for it. All right. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Throw yourself down. Uh, keep going, keep going. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Mm. Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Okay. There is a lot here. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to unpack it. Okay. Um, getting my new, sorry, trying to get my new um, battery. Um 
It's not working. Okay. Uh, Satan takes, sorry. The devil took him to the holy city. <laughs> the devil's city. messing me up right now. Sorry. So th- the devil takes him to the temple uh, and basically says to him, Jesus, nobody really knows who you are. Let's be honest. You know, I mean, you're going to have a hard, hard time getting known. Um, you want your ministry to be memorable? Uh, you weren't your name to be a household name. I mean, come on, Jesus, seriously, let's go ahead and prove your identity, right? Let's do something, uh, fantastical. Let's do something supernatural. So here's what I'm, here's what we're going to do. You're going to get to the top of this and you're going to throw yourself off and I'm going to be the announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages, come Mm -hmm. see the greatest show on earth. Jesus Christ, the son of God, free diving from the tallest building in all of Jerusalem caught by angels when he falls. Jesus, what do you think about that? That sound good to you? That's basically what he said. Yeah. He's trying. Basically, what he's saying is, let's try to get this plan going. You know, we don't wait three, three and a half years for this thing. Let's get this thing going now. Let's let's get some traction about us now. And it really reminds us of how many times Satan does the same to us. Mm-hmm. And, and what he's saying is, listen, you want to be that superhero the world wants. Mm-hmm. You want to be Braveheart. Yeah. You, you know, you want to be William Wallace. I mean, you want to be that guy. And Jesus responds and says to him, "What? What does he say in the text?" He you, says, it is written, do not test the Lord your God. Okay, so you have here, just like the last one, two extremes. You have want and need with appetite. What do you think the extremes are for the temptation of approval? What are the extremes on either side? And I'm gonna show you how these work in a moment. On I one hand, you have acceptance. Okay. People are gonna accept you. Okay. okay. And in the polar opposite of acceptance is what? Deny. Rejection. Rejection or denial. Yeah. yeah. So that's the that's the two extremes we have when we talk about uh, this idea of temptation. Okay. On the one hand, here's what happens. You may say, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. This is what this is like the, this is what the response is. I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I, in fact, I don't need anybody's approval. I'm fine. I'm fine by myself. I'm doing this for myself. Now, normally when a person says that, what do they really mean? What do they really mean? Hmm. No, I'm actually doing this for everybody's approval. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, I don't need anybody. No, seriously, no, seriously, I'm good by myself. But deep down inside, you want everybody to be recognize, yeah. recognize you. And every boy never really grows up. You still, you still that little, you know, ten year old boy saying, "Hey, mom, can you come see me shoot a basketball?" Or, yeah. "Hey, mom, could you come to my game?" Right? Um, and mm-hmm. we we never change. So on one hand, we seek acceptance but then on the other hand watch this you need approval from others so you seek you seek rejection you know like i don't you know i don't want to be rejected so you act like it's not a big deal but really you're seeking approval and then the flip side is you say you know what i want everybody to like me i do everything for people i want i want to post enough so people approve me i want to make comments online for people to accept me mm-hmm. i want to try to do something wild and crazy which is why kids do things out of the ordinary they do things dumb because they say, man, I just did that because I wanted to be love, loved and accepted. Yeah. So we look for others to affirm us. And this is the one I think I'm guilty of more than anything because I've always tried to fish in the approval of other people for, for the yeah. longest time. And I got the best lures. I mean, I've got the best, <laughs> I'm just telling you, I get the best lures to throw in that pond. Yeah, to you get got people that kind of fishing down. I got that fish. Down. Not the other Not kind of fish. Right. Kind. So uh, the core issue here, if you go below the surface of approval, what is the core issue here? Fear. Uh, no, fear was the last one. What is this one? This one could be fear too. Though. This one, it could be fear. Fear but... that people won't like you. Well, what happens when you feel bad that people don't like you? How does that make you feel? Lonely. Close. Sad. Mm. Shame. 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 You ever felt like shame before? Like something's wrong with you. I feel it right now for getting that answer Ooh. wrong. Ooh. <laughs> Who knew? All right, I'm, I feel way better now. My, my computer was... When my computer battery gets low, you ever, you ever preach before and then you look up and your battery level's like right on the edge? Yeah, and I'm like, I'm just going to depend on the Lord right now. That's what I say, Pastor. I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> Is that a Jesus joke at me? Yeah. <laughs> I, tell you, I tell you a funny, crazy time. One time I used to preach back in the day before iPads. I used to preach with, I'd, I'd write the sermon out manuscript, and I still do, but I would cut it down, Chris, and I would I would uh, paper clip it in my Bible, the entire sermon, like yeah. every couple of pages. I paper. So I, I thought I was really cute. Like, like I'm going to show up. This guy's super spiritual. He don't even have notes. He's just preaching <laughs> out of his Bible, you know? But when I'd open the Bible, I'd have like eight pages. Oh, in that's there. awesome. So I thought it was cool, but I thought it was cute, but, but, but can- and Candy was there for this event. This yeah, is a true blind preaching date. No, this, this was is how you impressed her. This was the second. No, the, the first preaching date was fine. This was actually a first real date yeah. that I was preaching at. So she comes and shows up, and it's a it's a uh, it's a gathering of a bunch of churches. I think we're in Hammond, Louisiana, 
bunch of churches gathered together, okay? And we were getting ready. I mean, it is awesome. They got probably two, 300 kids, you know, five, four or five churches. They're in this big worship center. And the power goes out in, in the whole grid in Imagine this town. That. Of course, I didn't Imagine think about that. that. Even back then, the power was going out for me. Okay, so the power goes out, and yeah. the guy's like, "You remember this?" Yeah. And the guy's like, "Man, I don't know what to do." And he's like, "Listen, do you mind? We're gonna move." This is true. He said, "We're gonna move all the kids outside down the street on the lawn of the road, like in the neighborhood. So we're just gonna like take up three or four homes, some of the church members there, and we're gonna line these three hundred kids up just on the front lawn. Can you preach without a mic?" It's like, of course, yeah, I mean, I got a lot, but yeah, I could do it. So we line all these kids up, Candy's there, and I'm just preaching outside, outside. in somebody's driveway, okay? It's true. And then all of a sudden, and the event started yeah. around 630, Ooh. all of a sudden, about halfway through the sermon, I'm noticing it's getting dark, like <laughs> dark, like real yeah. dark. Like I can't see. And then all of a sudden, it gets so dark where the guy's like, hey, do I need to like start a car and shine headlights? I couldn't see. And I still have like a third of the sermon left and the lights are out. Yeah. Okay? And you're not good at cutting things out of the sermon. And, and you know me. <laughs> to preach it till it's done yeah, yeah. <laughs> no but here's what's funny and this is funny so i'm i'm preaching and all of a sudden i hear woo, 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 down the street and it's like coming behind me i was like what is going on there are neighbors walking this vicious dog who's losing his mind while i'm preaching the lights are out the headlights now are trying to shine it was a debacle and i just had to summarize the end because i had no light so anyway that's, uh, so to summarize the end of this podcast, <laughs> shame. <laughs> We're talking about I was shame ashamed. Now. I was ashamed. Yeah. Okay. That's back, a good story. Though, that was Pastor. a great story about nothing. Okay. The core issue is know, like, what, shame. Oh, you were saying how you preach before iPads or because your laptop battery was going out. Yeah. Like, yeah, that yeah. That's it. Brings that PTSD because whenever the laptop battery goes out, I think gotcha. about that story. Okay. That okay. Uh, core issue, Andrew, is shame. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> shame is found in the first three chapters of the Bible. Go figure. Okay. It starts with them being naked and ashamed. Oh uh, no, no, naked and Afraid. unashamed. Oh, oh, it's at first they were Sorry. naked in chapter two and unashamed, show. and then in one, and then in one, we might have to uh, record uh, this entire episode. Uh, uh, and then we get one chapter later, and because of Satan's I feel like we're, work, they're running in the game. <laughs> oh, I was about to say it. I was literally about to say that, and you beat me. I was just I was waiting like, I for. Just had to throw I was it waiting in there, for. You know? the we went a whole season without running naked, without naked running like we did in the first season. Uh, not, let's clarify for new listeners, not us personally. We're not running naked. No, we're no, the, no, the, the Hellenist Olympic Games. The Hellenist ran. Yeah, yeah. we used to say it all the time. But they were they were clothless and unashamed back then. Yeah. But then in one chapter they actually have shame yeah in one chapter shame is satan's barricade don't miss this uh, between yeah. intimacy with god yeah they isolated themselves because you isolate yeah it keeps shame keeps us from loved ones shame keeps us from friends shame keeps us from god but there's a difference between conviction of sh sin and shame there's a big difference here right conviction of sin okay let me ask you what is the difference between shame over sin and conviction over sin do you know the difference uh Practically, I think if I'm convicted of sin, I go to the Father. I mm. go to the Lord with it. And if I'm in shame and I'm isolating, I just act like it doesn't exist. Yeah. It puts well, distance between me and him. Okay. That's good, yeah. Sam. Um, I would say conviction comes from God, Ooh, but yeah, shame does not. That's even better. Like, God mm, yeah, doesn't make true. us feel shame. That's exactly shame. right. Yeah, shame comes from Satan. Like, anytime I think about my past or whatever or things that i've done that i'm not proud of i can still myself like feel ashamed yeah. like golly how, how can god use I? me you know right. what I'm like yeah and and but then like if i sit in that shame i'm like that doesn't come from god you see what i'm saying yeah. that that comes from the actions that i did myself yeah you see so shame is almost it's self-inflicted yeah but yet conviction is god's telling you Hey, what you're doing is not right. You're going in the wrong direction. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a great. And yeah, y'all you, both on it. Okay, let me just clarify it simply this way. This this is both good. They're both good. Conviction of sin is a reminder from God that we are fallen human beings who have boundaries and limitations, mm -hmm. and in and of ourselves, we can't put ourselves back together apart from God. Okay. 
shame is the difference between shame is shame communicates there's something inherently wrong with you as a person yeah. and you are the problem basically it's mm-hmm. saying to you you're a mistake yeah you're defective think of it this way conviction says what i did was bad mm-hmm. and i need to come back to god shame says i am bad yeah wow. i'm a mistake Mm-hmm. See the difference, mm-hmm. which we know God doesn't make mistakes, obviously. And, and, and we're not defined by what we do, right? Our actions. So here's the thing. When we seek approval, here's what happens. It's a fascination really with celebrity. It's a fascination approval with fame. It's a fascination of acceptance and, um, accolades. And, and the reality is celebrityism undermines our leadership. Why? Because you can't be a celebrity to someone who knows you. Yeah. Hmm. People who know you aren't impressed with you. Yeah. Right. Celebrityism, in a sense, trades leadership for performance. And like I said at the beginning, the greatest, the greatest jo- freedom in life is when you get to the place where you have nothing to prove and no one to impress. impress okay. The core issue of ambition <laughs> is shame and guilt. Guilt says, uh, or, or, or um, is shame, and shame says, I will never be good enough. Yeah. Okay. Now, here are the Enneagram numbers two, three, and four. So, if you're two, three, and four in the Enneagram, that's us, you know, yeah. approval, your heart, you're, you're always trying to get everybody like you. Okay. Number three, temptation mm-hmm. number three, ambition. And we'll get through these, and I'll tell you uh, a little insight about how these all tie together. Okay. Number three is mm-hmm. ambition. This is the last temptation against Jesus. Now, watch this, verse eight. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and the angels came and began to serve him. Okay, Andrew, you go to First Chronicles, First Chronicles, the Old Testament. 29 12 i want to show you a cross reference here but satan is going to take jesus to this high mountain to overlook the world he's going to show him kingdoms and empires and uh and um everything of the world has to offer and he's going to say what i'll give you all this if you fall down and worship me yeah i'll give you all these things that is the lie of satan to us and it's a lie of to jesus why what is the problem with that with that for jesus I'll give you all these things if you worship well, he me. Can't, he can't give him anything. It's not his to give. Because, well, because why? he doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Well, okay, yeah, that too. But Jesus owns it already. Mm-hmm. Right. So how, the only reason, Satan, you're the prince of the power of the air is because of the uh, authority that has been given to you by God. So it's not yours. So Satan makes you think that he owns something when he owns nothing. nothing. And he's trying to use that against Jesus. And it's just a reminder for us, we don't own anything. Okay. Yeah. Right. The, the, the temptation of ambition, this is what it gets you. Even if you have a title, even if you own it, even if you paid for it, everything you own in mm. 50 years, 60 years mm. is gone from you. You have nothing. Mm. Even the church I pastor, even the, 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 the job you hold, it, it's not going to be yours in 50, 60 years. It's over. So it, it's a constant reminder that everything we have we steward it, mm. not own it. We don't own anything. We're simply stewards of what God has. Our homes, you ready for this? Our children, mm-hmm. our families, our ministries. Uh, every pastor listening, don't miss this, is an interim pastor. Right. Everyone, including me, including you, we're interim pastors. Prayerfully, you and I will be here for a long season, but again, that's God's timing. So eventually we will be gone. So the, the reminder is in first Chronicles. So, so go to first Chronicles 29, 12, and I want you to read what it, what, what, uh, it says here. Okay. So this is David praying here. Okay. Uh, he says, riches and honor come from you and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Okay. So what is he saying here? What is he saying about everything we own? Riches and it's honor. All yours. It's, all it's all God's. Yes. Go, and God gives it to mm-hmm. us. Uh, I always say it this way. God, and, and, and I've said this before, but God is looking to see who he can trust when no one's looking mm-hmm. behind the scenes. 
how you act when no one is watching, how you act when the lights aren't on, how you act when people mm -hmm. are not there, to see if he can entrust you with more later. Right. Okay. Right. So if, and I tell faithful a lot. Faithful and little, you'll be faithful and much. <clears throat> yes. And I, I think I've heard that before. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so, Luke. yeah. Sorry. So the idea is God is watching you to determine that. Now, that doesn't mean you're lesser than if you don't have a mega ministry or a larger church or a, a big time paying job. That doesn't mean you're lesser than that. But basically, let me use the ministry example because it's easier. I tell pastors this. I know you want to pastor a big church. Everybody gets in the ministry and you'll justify it and say, I want to pastor a big church because I want to make a bigger impact. I want to preach to more people. Mm -hmm. I want, and that's, that's fine. And that's a valid reason and praise God for it. But the reality is the ministry that we have been given a personal ministry is never achieved in our own yeah. strength. It is received from God. Yeah. Okay. So everything we have, the grace of God has been given to you. The, it has been measured to you. God has given you a measure of grace per, for each person. Paul says, Corinthians. So we've been given a measure of grace. If that's the case, that means God is not going to judge me based on how big the church is numerically, mm -hmm. how many buildings we built uh, physically, or uh, how much money we raised financially. Okay. That's all things he does, or even the people saved, or even the people who got, that's all things God does. What God is going to judge me on is how faithful I was to the assignment he gave me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And for some, the assignment is to be faithful to a church of 50 people in a small town in the backwoods that God's called you to. Yeah. For others, it's a church of three, 400. For others, it's a ministry of 10. Yeah, I would say for, for some, it's a ministry of 10,000, whatever it is, yeah. God has given you the assignment. So no, let me say one more thing. Yeah. So that removes all pride and jealousy and covetedness for something else. Yeah. And I've got, and I'm saying, I, I'm not saying I graduated from this course because I think I'm still in the remedial class, but the reality is you should not look on Instagram and see someone's church or ministry or whatever and think, man, uh, you know, why him? Uh, that needs to be me. And I can't No, God has given you a ministry assignment and believe me, it's enough. Right. Yeah. I remember what uh, the Scottish preacher Brown said to some of the students he was lecturing, they were graduating from seminary. And he said, I know you brothers will be tempted to want to pastor a bigger church with a bigger budget and more people. But I will tell you at the end of time, when you stand before Jesus, if you have a small church and have pastored it well, you will realize and say, I have had enough. Yeah. Whatever size church you're pastoring, I promise you, mm -hmm. you will stand before Jesus and say, that was enough. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say for <clears throat> maybe the majority of you listening right now, you may not be in vocational ministry, but God has placed your spouse and those three kids at your dinner table. Mm -hmm. The people you That's work with point. every single day that you are in and out of the office. Like it is not by coincidence that you are around these people every single day for eight hours a day. You yep. know what I'm saying? So yep. God has put a personal ministry right in front of you, whether you are in vocational ministry or not. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. because, and I say ministry is an example, but it's your workplace, it, yeah. it's your job, it's the amount, of, the, the number of kids you have. Yeah. God has given you an assignment. Your friend group. Right. And like he's gonna it. gauge you based on how faithful, remember, yeah. God always gauges effectiveness, not by fruitfulness. Yeah. That's something he does, That's good. but by faithfulness to him. That's why he uses the tree and branches illustration. He says, you're the branches, I'm the tree. The branches, they basically do, they're kind of an intermediary mm -hmm. place, a, a, a go between, between the sap of the root yeah. and the fruit at the end. Yeah. They're the intermediate, they, they literally, nobody looks at the branches. They either mm -hmm. cut the root down or they pick the fruit. Now watch this. The cool thing about a branch is a branch produces fruit that never benefits itself. Mm. That well, yeah. The, the branch the fruit, actually doesn't produce yeah, the fruit. The, yeah, the, but but the tree, the tree yeah. produces fruit on the branch, never for the benefit of itself, always for the benefit of others. That's an yeah. interesting but insight. That's how you know about. if the tree is healthy or not if it's producing fruit. That's right. good. The the the, it's the like you goal, wrote a book about that. I think wrote a book. Right? I know that. The goal bit, of yeah. the branch is to stay connected to the vine. Yeah. The branch cannot produce fruit and be faithful yeah. the moment it separates yeah. from the vine. Yeah. Ambition has two sides, strength and weakness. You're either really strong 
and uh, you're always boasting in self. You're seeking the next sale. This is how you, this is how you know you're in this category. You, you're trying to build something new. You want to get a larger portfolio, more stocks. You want your kids to be better than everyone else. You want to succeed at everything. Your son's mm -hmm. better than this sport, and and you vicariously live through your kids. That's the strong side. The weak side is you just basically cut corners and take shortcuts. Because I'm going to do whatever it takes to be approved, mm -hmm. right? So to one done. one yeah. instance, I'm overbearing, domineer, and then the other one can be withdrawn. You're like, man, I'm 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 done. I don't want if I can't win, I don't want to I don't want to play. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. People don't like me, right? Okay, um, you detach and check out. Okay, number uh, the the core issue here. What's the core issue of this idea of ambition? What's the core issue? If I can't win, I don't want to play, and if I don't win, what do I feel? Not shame, guilt. Guilt is the feeling, okay? This is the core issue. Satan lays out an ambitious vision for Jesus. He's like, listen, I'm gonna give you everything, man. That's all you gotta do, just worship me. And if Jesus passes on the offer, what is Satan gonna do? Satan guilts him. What do you mean you didn't want the, you don't want the kingdoms of the world? What are you talking about, right? What are you talking about you don't want to? Do? And I, I thought that's, that happens to us all the time. It's this idea of FOMO, Yeah. right? got to have the latest iPhone. You got to have the brand new uh, PS5. You got to be, uh, everybody else is going to this event. You got to go to the concert. You got to always, it's always more. You got to always keep doing more. And um, you have to say yes to everything. And it reminds me, and here's what I've learned through this. Every time you say yes to something, it's saying no to about four or five other things. Mm -hmm. So if I say yes to an event, if I say yes to an outing with someone, I'm saying no to candy at home on the Friday we have hanging out. Yeah. I'm saying no to the kids picking up from school. I'm saying no to hanging out. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying yeah. no to a lot of things. And uh, I think that changes the way you say yes and no to things. Let me remind you, and somebody told me this a long time ago, when someone asks you to do something normally in most scenarios, mm -hmm. it's always for their benefit never for yours yeah even if it's an event where you get paid even if it's somewhere where you get an accolade or it's if i ask you ask you to come do my digital pastor men's event online church men's event and i'm going to pay you whatever to speak that is a benefit to you mm -hmm. but i'm paying you because it benefits me or i'm asking you because it right. benefits me more and what happens is there are people in your life who are not benefiting from your absence. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, sure. And so ambition is this fascination with competition. Mm -hmm. I'm always com competing. It's the zero sum game. This is how the world works. The world can't, w this is how we work in the world. Either you win or I win, mm -hmm. but we both can't win. Yeah. And, the, and But here's the deal. In order for you to win, I have to lose. Yeah. That's the zero sum game. And I can't celebrate like we both are competing. No, one winner, one loser. So that's the idea of ambition. And the core issue here is guilt. Yeah. I'll never attain enough, enough. I'll never get ahead far enough. And the Enneagram numbers, eight, nine, and one. Yeah, I feel like you're reading my book right now, the journal. Yeah, right because there. eights <laughs> always want to, yeah, ambition. Eight, yeah. Eight, they always want to get ahead. Now, I said this before, every person was attacked in the Old Testament with these temptations, and I'm going to show you a few. Some were attacked by one or two, some by all three. The temptations plagued yeah, their life. Same. Okay, let's take it. We're going to do a quick pop quiz, and we're done. Jacob in the Old Testament, which one of these was he distracted mm -hmm. by? Which temptation? Jacob, the manipulator. What was Jacob's? Uh, temptation? Well, he had a couple. The, the manipulator. Yeah, the big one. Ambition. Wanted to get ahead of his brother. Yeah. Okay. That was his. That was his big one. Now, now a lot of them struggle with a lot of them. Uh, Esau. What did Esau give yeah. into, which eventually destroyed his life? His appetite. He had this appetite uh, that he, he that that he sin is crouching at your. Door. door brother you know uh saul <laughs> succumbed to ambition he wanted to be this king this this uh th this ruler of all things and his ambition to get ahead he shortcutted and uh cut corners in the process what about david david has a mm. few of them but the big one was appetite appetite with bathsheba that was david's samson Golly, he had appetite and ambition. He had them all. Yeah. <laughs> Samson literally had every single one of them. Uh, Peter, 
I mean, you can go all for I Peter, mean, but I'm definitely like, yeah. ambition. Yeah. Definitely approval of Peter. Yeah. Paul, ambition. Yeah. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, of the nation of Israel. But whatever was to my gain, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. So Paul is showing us he, re yeah, he replaced this ambition with uh, the gospel. Now, here's what's cool about this, and we'll put a bow on it. At the cross, Jesus permanently defeats all three temptations in our life. Did you know this? At the cross, Jesus is going to absorb the temptation so we don't have to. This yeah. is really cool. Jesus uh, on the cross becomes needy so we can be satisfied in life. He absorbs the issue in our life so we don't have to. He was needy, meaning he became hungry. Yeah. He was thirsty. I'm thirsty on the cross. On the cross, he says, I, I need a drink. So Jesus becomes needy in a sense, hard to think this way, but, he, but in order for us to be satisfied. Number two, Jesus became weak on the cross so we can become strong. Yeah. Finally, mm -hmm. Jesus was rejected by man so that we can be accepted by God. So you see these three temptations culminate at the cross. And basically Jesus is showing us that he is what we're looking for. So we put our trust in Jesus. Obviously he fulfills all those desires. Now, um, I, I was wrote something down. I want, I want to finish with, but it just reminds us that some of us in this world are striving so hard at some of these desires, right? And normally you don't figure it out until it's almost too late, mm. right? You look back and you realize, man, I'm doing all those things for God. Um, and I'm really doing them for ambition. I'm doing them for appetite. And so I'll just leave you with a couple of things. If you're listening, stop trying to do ministry for Jesus or good things for Jesus without intimacy with mm. Jesus. Yeah. Don't let what you do define who you are as a person. Stop striving in your own power, stop striving in your own strength and rest in the grace of God. Mm. Um, remember Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and, mm. and heavy laden or overwhelmed yeah. and I'll give you rest for your soul. Remember, Jesus never promised, listen to this, Jesus never promised an easy life. God knows he didn't do that because hmm. he didn't have one, but he did promise an easy life yoke if yeah. you take up his jerry bridges i'll close with this has the great a great line i've said this i've memorized it i've quoted it for years uh but here's what he said and it shows us how much we need grace he said on your worst day in the world on your worst day you and i are never beyond the reach of the grace of god yeah and somebody listening may mm -hmm. say man that's me all, you, I, I feel like today's the worst day. I feel like I'm far from God. I feel like God's not hearing my prayer. I feel like nobody's listening. On your worst day, listen to me, friend. You're never beyond the grace of God. But watch this. Mm -hmm. On our best day, the best day in our own strength, we are still desperately in need mm -hmm. of the grace of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On our best day. And so it's from grace to grace, first to last, the grace of God. And so I would just say if you're finding your um, satisfaction and seeking an appetite or finding your value and uh, approval of others or finding your joy and ambition in life, I would say rearrange, course correct, and come back and rest. And Jesus, rest in the word. Jesus defeated the devil not only because he quoted the mm -hmm. word, but because he knew the word yeah. and he was the word of God. Yeah, for sure. Well, Pastor, thank you for helping us understand the playbook of the enemy mm -hmm. so that we can identify that. And I want to give you one kind of exercise you can do that I learned from my wife, Jenny. And it, this is nothing new under the sun. This is something, we, you know, all of us in this room have done before. But she strategically calls it her battle book, where she will have a spiral note card of blank cards. And what she'll do is if there's a, a temptation or a, a lie from the enemy, she will fight that with Scripture. So mm. she will identify whatever it is that's creeping in her mind and taking over her mind, and she will memorize Scripture to specifically attack that or to fight to battle that right there so uh, maybe create what she calls a battle book where you you know what satan's hitting you with and you're fighting that with scripture you're learning scripture you're meditating on that instead of the lie or the temptation or whatever that may be
Awesome. And you could do it on your phone. I'm just thinking yeah. a, a crave way is just take a phone. And I wanted to do it when I was a new believer. I used to think this. I used to think, man, I, I wish I had scriptures in the moment because right. I didn't know the Bible back then yeah. very well. So I wanted to create this back in the day. I wanted to create a uh, business card laminated yeah. that said basically fear this scripture. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, addiction attack yeah. this scripture, anger mm -hmm. this scripture, worry yeah. this scripture. Yeah. So yeah. I think you, what I'm saying is you could do it on your phone oh, for sure. and have it as a family so that, mm -hmm. and, and Candy has done this for Rig a lot yeah. or Ryder when they have struggles, they'll just say, hey, here, yeah. remember. Also, let's, and now, I mean, I'm just thinking of it, the version app that most of us have on our phone, you can search scriptures by what you're struggling, like Topic, by yeah. topics, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So good. Awesome. anyways, a lot of resources you can dive into. Uh, the key is kind of putting in the work to to fight the good fight you know yeah. so memorizing scripture all right well hey we hope you enjoyed this episode pastor candy thank you so much uh if you did enjoy it share it with a friend leave us a review we would love um to read your reviews we'd love to connect with you also yeah. connect with us on social media uh like pastor addressed a question we got in today from a listener so if you got a question drop it there we'd love to address that as well appreciate you guys and we'll see you next episode.